How wonderful, how precious, how glorious is the lovely name that has saved us all. You know, I am extremely excited to talk to you. <laughs> There's a reason. It's because I can feel the hunger in the room. I can feel the desire in the room for him. And if we know anything about him, we know that he loves to satisfy the thirsty and he loves to feed the hungry. This is his way. He's just like this. In Matthew chapter 6, you remember he sees the large crowds coming to him. And the first thing on his mind is, where can we get food for them to eat? It's the same thing that's on his mind right now. I want to feed you. <laughs> this is what is in his heart. I know that your hunger is going to be satisfied continuously in this conference. Um, how many of you know what YouTube is? Let me see your hands. Okay. I have placed on YouTube some things that are very special to me that I want to share with you. They're instrumentals of just soft worship you can have for free. You just click, click in my name and subscribe and you can get all that stuff. Also, hours and hours of teaching as well on there. If you subscribe, you can have all of it. It's all there for free. And I just want to encourage you to go ahead and, and do that. It's a, it's a wonderful means because everywhere you can be taught and you can have experiences with God with your phone in a car waiting for your kids to get out of school. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I want to uh, tell you that before we get started. So just right now, just take a deep breath like this. Breathe in and breathe out. Yeah, just rest. Rest is the realm of God. Yeah, breathe in one more time. Breathe in and breathe out. The scripture says that God is seated. That means he's resting. He's always, in, he's always resting. Jesus is called our Sabbath. He is our rest. And in order for us to receive from him, we must join him there. Rest is the realm of perception. And then in perceiving him, you are able to receive him. Are you hearing me? This is very important. Why, is, why are these things so important? It's because so often people have encounters with God. And that's my burden in meetings like this is that there would be an outbreak of God and people would be touched and radically changed and then from here, in a couple of weeks, return to the same way they were before. We saw it, Daniel and I and Russ and Scott. We went to Brownsville and there was outbreaks of God, there was glory that would touch the people. We watched people get completely rocked by the Holy Ghost. And today, some of them do not even believe that God exists. Today, some of them do not follow the Lord. Some of them have returned back into sin. Do you want to know why? It's, it's because the public touch has got to turn into a private kiss or it will all fade away. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The reason why he gives a public touch is to draw you to the private kiss. There's something I... I say to my daughter, have you ever said something out loud and when you said it, God threw it back into you? Have you ever had that? You say something to somebody, you're like, whoa, God is saying that to me right now. I was tackling my daughter at night when she was going to bed and I grabbed her and I was trying to kiss her. And I said, if you don't let me kiss you, there's no way for you to love me. I said to her, just playing. And I tried again, I said, I said, baby, if you don't let me kiss you, there's no way for you to love me. I'm just joking. And the Lord spoke to me through it. And he said, Eric, if you don't let me kiss you, there's no way for you to love me. What, is, what does that even mean, Eric? It means this. You have to get touched. 
you have to get kissed. You have to be held. You have to know the sweet, intimate touch with him and behind closed doors when no one can see because all the public stuff is wonderful, but oh, it's so that you could fall in love with him and that you would know what it is to go into the king's chamber and be thrilled beyond anything you've ever imagined before. There is no higher delight. So I'm, I'm totally excited to share with you this key to happiness. <laughs> I'm excited to speak to you about the root of peace. I'm here and excited to talk to you about the bliss of life. Did you hear these words? Bliss, peace, joy. These are yours because they're him and he's given himself to you. Well, <clears throat> I want to say this too, that what the Holy Spirit has spoken with me to tell you may sound contrary to some of the things you've already heard, but I want to assure you it is not. It rather lies beneath many of the things that have been said. Do you understand what I mean? I felt I needed to say that. My heart is this that our greatest takeaway from this time together would be that when you go home and get back to normal life, you would experience the reality of his person in your life far beyond anything that you have had before this. That's the main concern. Some people will fall into a trap because we go back to work on Monday, if you know what I mean. And this time here has been wonderful and the outpouring of the Spirit's been great, but somebody will go back to changing diapers on Monday morning. Someone will go back to shuffling papers or changing some part on a car or going back to being submitted to a boss that's difficult to work with or maybe you go back home to a, a marriage that's hard or some situation that I'm not completely aware of and nor is anyone else here. But what has to be is that what we find in Him will help us in everything in our lives. And we have to recognize something about, about success. Because sometimes when we hear the things that we've heard here and we see such high quality caliber men of God, we begin to think that what we are and what we have is not as relevant. We think, oh, there's no way I'll be able to pack out a stadium like that or uh, may maybe one day or, and then we get this internal unrest going on, but I, I, I'm here to tell you something very specific, that we need to redefine in our own hearts what success looks like. Listen, success is not miracles. Success is not preaching. Success is not people falling when you pray for them. It's not packing out stadiums. It's not riches and it's not fame. Do you want to know what success is? It is a heart that is captivated by the love of Jesus. That's success in the eyes of God. Oh, there's a scary scripture. And it says, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? And he says, I didn't have a kiss with you. You had no kiss. You had public touches, but you had no private kisses. Oh, if you don't let him kiss you, there's no way for you to love him. You got to let him take you in and and hold you. If you've ever touched him, you know he's got one thing on his mind. He just wants to hold you. And there's something that happens as he holds you. It's like he drains out all your inward poisons. You know what I mean. Bitterness, selfish ambition, pride, anger, lusts. Oh, he drains them out as you just let him simply hold you. This to me is the secret of everything. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 13, and this is the message that the Lord has given me. I'm going to go through it quickly. In verse 13, Jesus says something that really hit me. He said, <clears throat> where is 13? Oh, here. Truly I say to you, he's talking, this is right after uh, Mary of Bethany has done this extravagant act of worship, okay? He says, Truly I say to you that wherever this gospel is preached, 
around the world. What this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Did you hear that? This means that Jesus wanted Mary of Bethany to be remembered. So if Jesus wanted her to be remembered, it's probably something that is very significant. And he has tied the memory of this woman together with the spread of the gospel. There's something about who she is that's intrinsic to the gospel itself. And you know, this, this bothered me because I, I think to myself, she's never preached a message, she's never taught a class, she never wrote a book, she's performed no miracles, she's only mentioned three times in the scriptures. Lord, what in the world could it possibly be about this woman that you would connect her to the testimony of your own name throughout the world? So I said, Lord, what is it? Why is she so special to you? And as I waited, I heard his voice. And he said, she loved me. And it doesn't sound very significant because you say it just like I did. But so many people have loved you, Lord. But why would you connect yourself so specifically with this woman in this way? So many have loved you. I felt like the Lord took me to the scripture to show me what kind of a love it was that separated her. What kind of a love she had that Jesus felt was intrinsic to the spread of the gospel. Okay? In, in Luke chapter 10 verse 38, the first mention of this woman that Jesus sees as so significant and is so special to him, it says that she's seated at his feet listening to his words. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, think of this picture, a, a crowded house, there's commotion, and then there's this woman. And she's on her knees, and she's fixed, and steady, and staring at him. This is the first mention of this woman. If I was there, I would have been stricken by her magnificent obsession. It would have hit me hard. Because she didn't care what anybody thought about her. She was looking at him. <laughs> Lord, I, I want to look at you. This is what I want in my life. I want to stare at the lamb who is slain. This is what John told you to do. He said, look at the lamb. She's teaching us something. She teaches us that he is too beautiful to look away from. And that there's actually honey dripping forth from his lips. And that honey that drips from his lips can be sweet to your taste. Oh, wisdom is thus for your soul. Like honey, eat honey, my son. Because in it you find wisdom. There's honey. And it trips from his lips. So, oh, Lord, I see that Mary of Bethany is a call to be captivated by thee. This is what she is. She's a demonstration of his worth. She's a proclamation of the preeminence of his person. That's what she's doing by sitting and staring. Her love cries, he's greater than his gifts. <laughs> Her love cries, he's more wonderful than his wonders. Stare at him. He's greater than the anointing. He's more desirable than the anointing. He's lovely. <laughs> She's not standing in awe of his powers. No. She has found, she has found something so much more valuable. Do you want to know what it was? It's this. She found that he himself is the fulfillment to her person, the joy in her life, the peace in her heart, and the satisfaction to her soul. She is stricken breathless by the overwhelming conviction that he is more lovely than anything else she has ever seen before. This is what she's saying to us. This is the testimony 
of Mary. She's realized that being with him is to have everything she has ever wanted, be everything she ever wanted to be, and arrive everywhere she's only dreamed of going. She has found that his presence has freed her from the need to have anything else. She has found that the most, that, that she has found that most of all of her prayers have vanished simply by his presence. <laughs> How? Because she has found that he was really the only thing she ever needed and really the only thing she ever really wanted. This is what Mary of Bethany is showing us. His presence transformed the mundane and common house that she lived in into a garden of spices with her beloved. So she drew near near enough to hear, if nothing else, his breathing. Lord, I give you all my attention. I desire you. Just say this with me. Say, Lord, I give you all my attention. I desire you. A.W. Tozer said, when the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in there heaven has begun upon the earth isn't that beautiful many of you are saying I don't I don't know this I don't know this let me tell you Jesus called what I'm talking about right now what we see in Mary he called this the good part Jesus went on from there and he calls this good part, the thing that is indestructible or in, undiminishable, untouchable, eternal, it can never be taken away from her. This is the good thing, he says. Then the next thing he goes on to say is, he calls it the one thing that is needed. Do you hear this? These are the words of Jesus. This is not me. Jesus has shown the picture of Mary's obsession with him and fixation upon him. And she, he points to her and he says, this is the one thing that is needed. In other words, the only necessity for life is right here, staring at me. He is too beautiful to look away from. She shows us that the essential Christian message is not behave, but behold. You know, you can really tell who doesn't really want God to rule their lives by who doesn't choose to take time to simply sit and listen to him. Did you hear that? You can tell who doesn't really want God to rule their lives by who doesn't take time to simply sit and listen to him. See, Martha was too busy for the bliss and enjoyment that Mary experienced. She was too busy. Her faith and her relationship to Christ was wrapped up in what she was doing for him. Oh, how easy it is to hide behind activity. Are you hearing me? Jesus contrasted them, not me. I did not, this isn't my message. This is right here in the scriptures. See, one is looking at him. One is looking at him. The other one is not. One is listening to him. The other one is not. One is near him. The other one is not. One is at rest. The other one is not. She's too active to give him her attention. Martha Kilpatrick wrote, activity can mask an empty soul and give a fake costume of nobility. Bill Johnson said, busyness can be artificial significance. <laughs> Madame Guyon said, it is so often our activities that obstruct our union with him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Martha chose occupation for the Lord over preoccupation with the Lord. She wanted to feed him more than to feed on him. She preferred more to be around him than to look at him. So many people have been content to see the things around him and not look directly at him. It's a trap to get mesmerized by his acts and forget about his person. It's so easy to love the flow and forget his face. But there's a face that can be looked at and it's beautiful 
And as we continually look unto this beautiful face, it will blind us to all these other things that are constantly pulling for us, and that's called satisfaction. Satisfaction is not a perk of his presence. It's the very means by which he frees you and empowers you to be able to obey him. Well, Eric, I'm not understanding. Listen, you got to be kissed so you can love him. Michael said to me one day, Kulianos, he said, in order for my heart to love him constantly, my heart must see him constantly. I know me, and if, if I know me, it's probably something like you. If I don't see him, I'm, I'm degenerative. My mind, my eyes, my heart, my intentions, my motives, I'm degenerative. I'm literally like a snowball effect. I got to see him. And even today when I woke up, I put my head against that head, my back against that headboard, and I said, I got to see you. I look to you. I worship 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 you. And the sweetness of God began to flow in as the receptivity of my soul opened through adoration. I worship you. My soul began to open, and he flowed in with peace that passes all understanding and he filled my heart with joy that's unspeakable and full of glory I'm telling you these things are for us so that all the situations in our lives have no bearing on whether or not we have peace or joy because we're mesmerized and staring and fixed upon his person this is what Mary is trying to show us Martha was unable to see the real significance of having the Lord in her house. And that's what activity can do. It'll rob your attraction to God. Martha chose to value other things over looking into his eyes. Corey Tin Boom said, beware the barrenness of a busy life. Martha is fruitless. The Spirit of God thought her work, whatever she was doing, was so insignificant he didn't even name it in the scriptures. Her work died with her. But Mary became a message to all generations connected to the gospel itself. Do you see? You say, what am I supposed to do, quit my job and move to a cave? I got 12 kids. I got two businesses I'm running. I'm in school right now. Let me just define busyness for you. Because busyness is not having a lot to do. Okay? Here is the definition of Martha's barren busyness. She has eclipsed his worth with work. That's the definition of busyness. It is to have replaced the simplicity of Christ with multiplicity of your own, the multiplicity of your own ways. It was John Wesley from here who said, simplicity is a loving intent upon Jesus alone, seeking no other person or thing. And so it's not, busyness is not having a lot to do. Jesus had a lot to do, but it never made its way into him. He remained inwardly disconnected to be able to adore, to adore his father in the midst of everything so that his father became the source of everything. Only if he's center can he be source. And if he's not center, he's not source. And if he's not source, something else is. That's Martha's problem. Not that she had things to do. What is dead activity? It's covering the restless bankruptcy of your soul with things to do. Things that he never breathed into you himself. Maybe you thought it was a great idea. But it didn't come from him. Even as Dan was saying last night, hoping people, they walk their lives out, hoping that no one will be able to tell that they've been avoiding the sweet communion with the Lord this whole time. It's easy to keep the outward things going and stop gazing into his face. Mary shows us that he, he must come before all of his things. It's easy to cheat on God with stuff God gave you. Did you hear what I said? It's easy to cheat on God with stuff that God gave you. 
When Jesus talks to Martha, he shows us that Martha's way, which is not looking at him directly, is the source of worry and judgment and even living bothered. <laughs> he says, you're worried and you're bothered about so many things. But she's found the one thing that's necessary. She eclipsed the simplicity of looking upon him with the multiplicity of her own ways. Isn't it funny that Martha, in her clamor, tries to diminish what Mary's doing? You notice that? But you notice that Mary, just like the lamb she's staring at, offers no rebuttal to her. <laughs> Workers always murder worshipers in one way or another. to gaze to gaze at him exposes the ones that are not gazing do you understand <laughs> this choice is ever and always before you and I we are today what we chose yesterday we are not today what we neglected yesterday and we will be tomorrow what we elect today and the choice is yours to gaze he's made his face completely available to you the second time she's mentioned, we'll just go through one more after this. The second time she's mentioned is in John 11. Her brother has died. The Lord arrives on the scene and Martha meets him. What does she meet him with? She talks to him. She gives him dialogue. Even theological dialogue. She says, I know he'll resurrect on the last day. But in Christ's dialogue with Martha, he didn't find what he was looking for. So the scripture says he looked for Mary. Words will never replace worship. He wasn't looking for someone who threw words at him or to exchange words with. He wanted worship. And he's looking for her. He's looking for her. And when, man, the first time I read this, it hit me so hard. The Son of God is there and He's looking for Mary. Where's, where's Mary? That touches my heart. And I'm saying He's looking even today. He looks in this room and He looks for a Mary. In the midst of all, it's like He's looking for one. I was, I was at this one event and all these prayers were going up and people were crying out for this and crying out for that and I was taken up in a vision above the whole room and all of these prayers were going up and they were all one color prayers coming up but there was one person that had one different color than anybody else and in this vision I was able to hone in closely to this one different colored prayer that I was above in this vision and I leaned in to hear this prayer that was different color than all the other prayers and the prayer was this you 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 Lord I want you Lord even last night when I when I was talking about when he said sanctify my name he wants his name picked up again above all his things and lifted higher and higher because he's more lovely and he's more beautiful and he will literally blind us to everything else. <laughs> so here she comes to him. Her brother has died. Her heart is hurting. She does not understand. You know what she does? She throws herself at his feet. Do you see now why she's so special to him? Everybody else is standing up, talking. They've got opinions about this, that, and the other. They even want to question the Lord. What does she do? She takes everything and throws it down at his feet and says, You are more worthy and more lovely to me than all the answers and facts and explanations that I could ever find. You're more worthy. But here's the problem. Men would much rather explain than adore. Men would much rather inquire than simply adore. But Mary shows us she's willing to worship him even though she does not understand him. This is what she's teaching us. I'm sure she had feelings and thoughts about the situation. But she threw them down with her own life. 
at his feet. This is the beauty of Mary's love. She's literally saying that your presence here is more important to me than answers. Maybe I don't know what you're going through right now and I don't know what you're looking for from the Lord. But I know this, that he's more important than all the answers he could ever give you. And I think sometimes we get so blinded by what we can receive from him and we eclipse him with the stuff that we want from him and we start coming to him for something other than him and we wonder why we keep missing him. And the sweet, blissful enjoyment of his person. <laughs> Lord, you are lovely to me. You're lovely to me. So Mary worshiped and the Lord wept and though Mary said a similar phrase that Martha said, Jesus responds in resurrection power to her. Do you see this? She shows us that she would rather move him than understand him. She was much more focused on touching him than defining him. She's special to Jesus. She shows us that something takes place in adoration that makes understanding just not that important anymore. Do you understand? <laughs> the memory of her, which is intrinsic to the gospel, is God's invitation for all to love him as she has loved him. She's the embodiment of the first commandment. Do you see? She's the lovesick one. She's sick with love, and she has these symptoms of sickness, which include a fixed gaze, I can't look away from you. I pray what would happen to you is you'd become so lovesick that you would have this same problem. I cannot look away from you. So that no matter what other people are doing to you, it doesn't matter, because you have to take your eyes off of him to look at them anyways. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I believe this is very important. The last time that she's mentioned, and this is the last one, and it's quicker. She's again blinded by her surroundings. She takes a very costly vial of perfume and she breaks it and she pours it over his feet and she tries his feet with her hair. She pours all of it on him. All of it. A part of it? No, all, because he is all to her. And what you give to him, and how much you give to him, and what you hold back are all a measure of the condition of your love for him. And she pours out everything upon him. And when she does, the purity of her love caused a rise in the impure Judas. You notice this? He says, why wasn't this sold and the money given to the poor? Do you know what this shows me? It shows me that Mary scandalizes all those who love the work of the Lord more than the Lord of the work. You know what it shows me? It shows me that the purity of only wanting Him exposes the impurity of wanting something from Him. Judas says, yeah, this should have been sold. Jesus says, the poor you'll always have with you, but me you will not always have. In other words, Jesus is saying, someone greater than good things is here. And in your life, someone greater than good things is here. And you can look at him. And you can find in him everything that is needed. Now here's the crazy part that when she breaks this perfume and she pours it on him, now her perfume's on him, and she wipes his feet with her hair, now she smells like him and he smells like her. Such is the life that is lived in loving adoration of the Lord. The scripture says that the whole house was filled with the fragrance, in other words, their sweet personal intimacy affected everyone around them. And I'm telling you, so it will be with you. 
And if you choose to set your gaze and fix your heart and live wrapped, R-A-P-T, in his presence, wrapped in him, Lord, I look to you above, above everything else. <laughs> Mary hit the gospel on the head that God wants to mix with man. Mary hit the target. God wants you to become the message and not just carry one. And adoration was their mingling. Sweet adoration was their mingling. And maybe this is what Paul meant when he said, we are a fragrance of life unto life to some and death unto death to others. And so an ordinary woman who never wrote a book, who never preached a sermon, who never performed a miracle, stole the heart of Jesus and shows us what the gospel is supposed to bring everybody to, the feet of the Lord below him, staring at him, worshiping him, mixed with him. My desire is that grace for adoration would come upon you, that there'd be a rock struck in your heart and this wellspring of adoration will erupt out of you and it would change the way that you wash dishes and change diapers and vacuum floors and travel on airplanes and serve at your job and sit in a meeting and drive down the street and counsel and teach. You'd be erupting on the inside, erupting by the sweet empowering presence of God. I'm going to close with this story. One time when I was... First born again, a man came to pick me up on a road trip. I tell this story almost everywhere because it changed my life. And he got in the car and he looks at me and he says, let's pray. So I did the only thing I knew. I just started rattling off in tongues and praying with all my might, just shooting stuff out everywhere. Just, I didn't know what else to do. It's all I had seen. I was mimicking what I had seen. And this man waited for me to get tired. He knew it was going to happen at some point. And he waited for the smoke to clear from my all-out assault on hell and God and everything else. And with a steaming coffee in one hand and the steering wheel in the other, he went like this. Jesus, I worship you. And he got quiet. He said, I give you glory, Lord, and there's no one like you. I worship you. I worship you. And I was, I was tearing up. I, the presence of the Lord so flooded the car. But at the same time, I was so, like, frustrated with how easily he touched God. And I learned a very, very valuable lesson that day. And that lesson was this. One ounce of adoration is worth tons and tons of efforts and strivings. So if I'm gonna sum up this whole message, I'm gonna sum it up with one phrase that you'll never forget, I pray, that you get it tattooed on your forearm. And it's this. Snuggle, don't struggle. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise. I do. I give you glory. I give you honor. Come on, just worship. Yeah, just show him that you're a Mary. I will look at you. 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 Come on, just look. I will gaze at you. Ah, la, 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 ah, la, la, ah, la, yes, te, oh, I will look at you. I will look at you. I will look at you, I will look at you I will look at you, I will look at you Worthy 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 Yeah.
Some of you need to learn how to drink.
let our lives be a sweet fragrance. Let our worship rise to bless your heart. Not just our words, not just our songs, but our whole lives. Lord, make lovers here today. Teach us to love you. Teach us to rest. Lord, in this high-tech social media, never one moment of unoccupied time society we live in Lord would you teach us to switch off all the noise give you our hearts Jesus said, <laughs> take my yoke upon you. <laughs> my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And give your burden to me. I'll take it for you. I don't know what burden you're carrying today. But if it's not the easy, light yoke of the Lord, you're carrying the wrong burden. So while we give it to you right now, whatever it is that we're carrying, whatever's weighing our hearts, we give you condemnation. Some of you feel so beaten up by the devil. That's not his burden. 
His burden is light. Some of you are so worried about the future. Anxious, fearful, doubtful. That's not his burden. <laughs> Look at the grass. Look at the flowers. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. How much more will I take care of you? <laughs> I just felt the Lord say this to me to some of you that are wondering right now if you're even saved. The devil has so messed with you that you wonder if he even loves you. You say, Lord, do you really love me? <laughs> he says, come to me. Come to me. Lord, I pray that your love would just invade every heart right now. Because, Lord, we can never truly love you until we receive your love for us. We can never initiate this exchange. But we can receive. I want you to receive right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for an outpouring of that love right now. A baptism of love. <laughs> In Jesus' name, we'll break our hearts. But let us look on the cross as the ultimate expression of love. Romans 8, 32, if God spared not his son, gave him up freely for us all how will he not with him also freely give us all things but we're overwhelmed by your love sing this as an anthem 
as a prayer, as a cry from the depths of our heart, not just as a song. I hate, I hate when I sense people are just singing words that they've never even thought about. I heard a preacher, an old preacher once say, God could send all of us to hell for the lies we sing on Sunday morning. <laughs> but I sense that here today, our hearts are really stirred for him. You wouldn't be here otherwise. There's a lot of other things you could be doing on a Saturday afternoon. Song. Let's just sing it together. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. More than words can say. I need you more than ever. you more, more than yesterday, I need you, Lord, more than words can say, more than words can say, I need you more. More than the song I sing, more than the song I sing, more than my next heartbeat, more than anything, more than anything, and Lord, as time goes by, I'll be by your side, cause I never want to go back to my old life, I need you more. Need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. I need you more than ever before. I need you more. I need you more. God is doing here is so sovereign. I do not approach this pulpit without fear and trembling. I hear the words over and over in my spirit. It's time for an outpouring.
It's time for an outpouring. It's time for the glory of the Lord to fall on this church. It's time for an outpouring. It's time. My heart feels like it's about to blow out of my chest. I'm so hungry for the Lord. I want to see a move. Shake a nation, God. Shake the UK, Jesus. Shake the UK. Do it again, Jesus. Do it again, Jesus. Do it again, Jesus. Send your rain. Send your rain. Send your rain, Jesus. Do it again. as though I'm stuck here because I know I have something to deliver to you but I know there's more that God wants to do I saw I saw a wave of joy joy sweeping out over the crowd he was turning mourning into dancing he was taking away the sorrow and replacing it for joy it was breaking out over his people out and touch him. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is here right now. Reach out and hold his hand. Tell him you love him. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is here right now. You're here. You're here. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Come on, lift your hands. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is here right now. Welcome him, welcome him, welcome him, welcome him. Tell him he's here. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is here right now. Tell him he's here right now. He wants to hear it from your lips. Tell him. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit here right now. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to talk with you. Tell him now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is here right now. Whatever your need is, reach out and touch him. Tell him now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is here right now. Come on, come on, team. Sing it like. 
like you mean it, tell him now he's here. Oh, Spirit, oh, Spirit. Speak to us now. Your people are listening. Speak to us now. Speak to us now. You're listening. We're listening. Because you're here. Because you're here. Stay with me, team. Stay with me, team. I'm going to give you a prophetic word that I saw for your nation. You're here, you're here, you're here. I saw a endless beach and a giant hand and a stick. The giant hand was holding a stick in the sand and drawing back three, three deep, profound lines from where the water meets the shore on the beach. They were very deep, they were very deep and very wide. It was interesting because the water, even in high tide, was moving around the sides of these lines, but these lines were not being affected. When the hand finished with the third line, the waters rose and washed away the lines. 
I believe what the Lord is saying to the UK is this. These three lines are very significant. They signi signify 30 years, each representing 10 years. Every 10 years over the last 30, God has stirred the hearts of England with the possibilities of him. Being able to do it again, Lord. To bring back the UK to her knees. But the completion of the 30 is over, says the Lord. The completion of the 30 is over, says the Lord. And I hear the Lord sing, the water of the Holy Spirit will no longer just be visible, but will overtake you. It will cover you, for I am releasing the deep. I am releasing what has been submerged by skepticism and suspicion. And I am filling the streets. I'm filling the cities. I'm filling the towns. I'm filling the boroughs. I'm filling the parishes. I am filling the UK. I see the slumber is lifting. The children are smiling. For you say we have memory of your abundant goodness, and they will shout joyfully of your righteousness, Psalms 145.7. So take heart, UK, take arms, know the season is upon you, but with great goodness comes great contention and attack upon your life and your faith and your land. I am also seeing there's a restoration of the three merging as one. There was a separation of apostle and prophet, evangelist and pastor teacher. What happened in the past? But God says the division is no more. It's no more. He's washing away the lines. The high tide of the spirit is flowing in the UK. Hear the Lord saying, be encouraged. I am raising up those like William and Henry who will bring attention back to the church in order to build. But these foundations are not brick and mortar and built with your hands, but are by my spirit, says the Lord. Let my fire be your light. Let my fire be your seal of love. Repent and I will fill your land with overflow of my storehouses, says the Lord. England, your shield shall be my name. Holy Spirit, moving. Holy Spirit's moving. Come on, friends, just open your mouths. Just open your mouths. If you, if you know how to pray in the Spirit, just open your mouth and pray in, in the Spirit now. Just welcome him. He's removing skepticism and suspicion from your hearts. Enter by faith. Enter by faith in the that which is spoken over your hearts, over your lands, over the things you love, over your homes. Tell them to move. Tell them to move. Ask them to move. Come boldly to him in this hour. Some of you need to repent. Some of you need to repent for the pessimistic outlook you've had about your country. Now is that opportunity. The fire is going to fall on you. Be that sacrifice. Be that sacrifice. I'm seeing all kinds of things right now. All kinds of things. I'm seeing the turbulent waters becoming a, a narrow strait. I'm seeing turbulent waters turning calm and becoming a narrow strait.
just heard this Jenny 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 your grandmother is getting healed right now you will know who I'm talking about Jenny because you gave her a brooch that looks like a flower your grandmother's being healed right now friends all across this place just join hands just join hands. What God is doing right now is incredible. I have a message called Hitting the Mark. I was going to preach a message called Hitting the Mark. I believe we've done that today. If you don't have somebody to hold hands with, please stretch across the aisle. Stretch across the aisle, hold hands. Everybody. I'm going to pray one time and release an impartation for hearing the Lord. That the Lord would begin to use you, not just in signs and wonders, but he would use you in the revelatory gifts. That it would be like the days of 1 Corinthians 14 when the unbeliever walks into your church and exclaims, God is surely amongst you. Because the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy is so high. It's so high. It's so high. And it convicts people of living in lesser glory. Make sure you have somebody's hand. The Holy Spirit is about to move through this place. He's already been moving, but he's about to move through this place with a spirit of revelation and prophecy. Holy Spirit. We're going to sing that Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're here. Sing it. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you're here right now. Just walk in. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I can see him descending on some of you. I see, I see over here like blue flames of fire. Yeah. 
Just begin to thank Him. Just thank Him for the gift. Thank Him for the things you've just received by the Spirit. Just tell Him thank you. As a sign of receiving, just say, I thank you, Holy Ghost. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Believe you have received. I believe have received I believe I believe believe you have received just say thank you Holy Spirit sometimes he just wants to know are you thankful thank you Holy Spirit thank you. sing it Holy Spirit you're here Holy Spirit Holy Spirit continuing to move in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, you're going to continue to move in us as we surrender to you. There's nothing greater than your presence, your touch. Your touch changes me. It changes us from glory to glory to glory. 
seal this work in our hearts. Lord, I pray that this day would be marked in our hearts, in our lives, for the rest of our lives, Lord. May this day be stamped in us that we can look back and remember that we'll never be the same. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Can we give the Lord a hand and clap of praise? In the name of Jesus, we bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We glorify you, Jesus. You're an awesome God. You're an awesome God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'll never be the same again. Amen. All right, listen now. I told one of my colleagues down there, I said, I have the awesome job of stopping this. <laughs> I hate it. I wish we could just keep going on and on. But listen, we do need to give you guys a short break. And then we're going to come back. And then we're going to see the fire of God continue to fall. Amen? We're going to be doing our fire tunnel. Todd White will be speaking. Daniel will be speaking. It's going to be, oh, it's going to be amazing. But what we need to do now is a, a short break. Doors will open at 5.30. Service will begin promptly at 6 o'clock tonight. I do need to ask a favor. I need to ask everyone to take all of your stuff with you. Bibles, jackets, product. The staff need to do some work in here in preparation for tonight. So please, if you could take your jackets, your Bibles, and your stuff with you. We're going to have to lock up for a little bit. And then at 5.30, an hour and 45 minutes, doors will open and will begin at 6 o'clock. We will see you soon.